as we start our study this morning. The title is For Who Has Known the Mind of the Lord? And our scriptures are from Romans 11, verses 25 through 36. So let me read our scriptures and I'll drop back and we'll start our study. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this ministry, least you should be wise in your own opinion. The blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. <clears throat> Verse 28, concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For as you were once disobedient to God, yet have now obtained mercy through their own disobedience, even so these also have now become disobedient, that through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. Verse 32, for God has committed them all to disobedience, that he might have mercy on all. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has become his counselor, who has first given to him, and it shall be repaid to him. For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. So as Paul continues um, his, his letter, uh, speaking to the Gentiles now. Um, he also speaks to those of Israel, uh, corporately and singularly. He speaks to those uh, in, in a way that would encourage them that all is not lost. And I think it's a message that resounds uh, for us today. The all is not lost. If you're in the middle of a spiritual battle, remember, if God is for you, who can be against you? Nobody. If you're in the midst of a physical prayer opportunity, you have to remember that nothing touched you that did not have to get by the sovereign hand of God. And, and although that circumstance in your life, that physical circumstance or what you're going through might be the most horrendous trial of your life, God has a plan. God has a purpose. And you simply need to be still and know that he is God. For Israel corporately, they are not one and done. For corporate Israel, they, they're not finished. It's not the end of the road for them. God has now chosen to minister to the Gentiles, but he is also ministering to the Gentiles individually, as well as uh, the Jews individually. And, and so it's not an aspect of abandonment. What it is, it's an aspect of setting things in order. It's an aspect of, of doing things according to God's will and God's timing because of God's purposes. And one of the things that I think is so hard for us as, as the redeemed, as his children, as the saved, whatever you want to call us, is that God at times doesn't think like we think. And that's problematic, right? I remember being a young Christian and uh, our family going through all kinds of prayer opportunities with, with our children. And I would cry out to God, it's like, don't you get it? Aren't you listening? Can you not understand what we're in the middle of here? And you know what? I never audibly heard anything back from him. And it's like, are you kidding me right now? But as I would dive into his word, as I would uh, hang out in fellowship with, with godly friends, uh, those that do God's word, I would be encouraged that, no, he has a plan. He has a purpose. This is going to work together for his glory, my good, and the good of those whom he loves. And so as Paul continues to bring forward truths uh, out of Romans to so many uh, in his audience, God does have a plan, and we are part of it. God has a plan, and corporate Israel is part of it. 
God has a plan, and the unsaved Gentiles are part of that. God has a plan, the unsaved Jews are part of that. God has a plan. Might not be our plan, but he has a plan that's far better than our plan. Reading out of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 through 18, Ephesians speaks of Jesus Christ being, being our peace and reconciling us to God, the past, the present, and the future. Reading out of uh, Ephesians 2, For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. And that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and he preached peace to you who were far off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. See, it's Christ and Christ alone. Christ in him crucified. Christ in him resurrected. Christ in him ascended. Christ in Christ alone are all reconciled. And, and see, that is so hard for many to understand because surely I throw my ducats in the tithing tray and I find favor with God. Surely I volunteer for the programs at church and I find favor with God. I mean, I know on that day, as I'm, as I'm blasting into the heavenlies, I'm going to hold up my attendance sheet and go, look, didn't miss a day. How did that work? And it doesn't work that way. It's through Christ and Christ alone. The simplicity of the gospel <coughs> is its simplicity. Don't let others fool you. Don't let men uh, put a hook in your mouth and, and drag you in different directions. It's Christ and Christ alone. It's not, well, brother, I understand that. You accept it. I saw you go forward. It was an awesome thing. My, my heart was warm. Oh, whatever. My heart was warm when you went, but did you do this? Are you? No, it's dependent upon the blood of Jesus Christ. The grace of God is justifying us, not we justifying ourselves. So don't let anybody rip you off. On the other hand, don't be a complacent Christian. Don't uh, have um, a lazy grace about you. It cost God his highest to give his son on your behalf. It cost his son his blood on our behalf. Don't take what you've freely been given as just something that now it's a box you check off and you, you go on with life. Don't do that. Because Paul doesn't want his audience to do that. He doesn't want those that are saved, those that are unsaved, those that are corporate Jews, those that are individual Jews, those that are corporate Gentiles. He, he wants them to understand the grace and the glory and the goodness of God. Starting our study, verse 25 this morning, for I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Paul once again wanting his audience to know that Israel has not been forsaken. And, and, and we're exhorted in Romans, I'm going to read Romans 12, 16, to not be wise in our own opinions about different things. Reading out of Romans 12, 16, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. And then the following verses, the following verses speak of the blindness that's come upon Israel unless they turn to the Lord. We know 2 Corinthians 3, 14 through 16. But their minds were blinded, for until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament, because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. See, 
the enormity of the grace and the goodness and the provision of God. The veil remains on their heart when they read, yet if they seek and they search, the veil is removed and God is so faithful in embracing those who seek him and search for him with all of their heart. And the incredible aspect of by grace through faith, we come to know him. Paul further states that those found worshiping him will be saved through grace by faith. I want to read out of Hebrews 11, verses 1 through 16. I don't know how many of us get to hang out in Hebrews, but just an incredible part of Scripture that just takes and boggles the mind, warms the heart, and, and just draws breath into our lungs, speaking of our forebears. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it being dead, still speaks. Verse 5, by faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death, and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. I'm going to stop there for a second. Do you have that testimony that you please God? We are in the midst of a mess. And I don't know how many of you have looked around and come to understand that we are in the midst of a mess in this time that we live. There are many who are in the pulpit, and perhaps I'm one, who shouldn't be there. There are many who bring forward God's word and they uh, twist it and they use it for their own good that they might take and take the the flock captive. There are many that are involved in politics who, that's all I'm going to say, there is much going on in medicine that can confound and can take and uh, confuse so many of us. There are so many things going on in society and culture that it's mind-boggling. And, and the problem is, is if you grow a backbone and you take a stand, then all of a sudden, yeah, that doesn't work so much anymore either. But, but what, we, what we read here in Hebrews 11 is we read of our forebears, we read of the integrity they had, we read of the backbone that they mustered up. I'm going to read that again about out of verse 5 of Hebrews. By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Do you please God? You don't have to please me. You don't have to please your your better half. You don't have to please your neighbors. You don't have to please your employer. The the one thing you do have to do is please God. You please God. Are you making those decisions that, um, that please him? Continuing in verse 6 of Hebrews 11. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is rewarder of those who diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place where he would receive Uh, as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He waited. He waited. We don't wait too well in this day and age, do we? I I mean, I don't think, I, I don't at times wait too well. It's like, God, let, let me give you a hand here. You know, and God says, nah, that's not going to work. That's not going to work. 
God has a plan. His timing is perfect. And, and, our, and our forefathers knew that. Verse 11 of Hebrews 11. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embrace them, and confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out of, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Speaking of us, past, present, future. Speaking of corporate Israel, past, present, future. Speaking of the individual Jews, past, present, future. Individual Gentile. God has a plan. God has a purpose. We can see that through the entirety of his word. We can see that, uh, especially in Old Testament, is the Old Testament promises were brought forward and brought to fruition. And in that, you don't have to second guess the one whose image you're created in. You don't have to go forward and say, yeah, but yeah, really? You, you simply have to trust. You have to believe and go forward. And it doesn't say walk by sight, not by faith. It says walk by faith and not by sight. Verses 26 and 27 of our study this morning. And so all Israel will be saved. It is written the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So Paul points out that God has made a covenant of his, with Israel and he will be faithful to bring these promises to fruition. Read out the book of Isaiah. We, we essentially read what Paul is quoting in Isaiah 59, 20 through 21. The Redeemer will come to Zion and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, says the Lord. As for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them. My spirit who is upon you and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your descendants, nor from, nor from the mouth of your descendants' descendants says the Lord, from this time and forevermore. God does not bring forward promises and then uh, break those promises. God does not bring forward truth and then change that truth because somebody's situation is, is changed. The canon of scripture is immutable. That means it never changes. God is immutable. It means he never changes. We're finite. It means that we have limited shelf life, right? We're finite. God is infinite. There is no shelf life with him, man. He is like forever and ever and ever and ever. A forever past, forever present, forever future. I think of um, the enormity of God at times when, when I think of perhaps looking uh, at the center of uh, all that is uh, important to me, Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. But then I think of all that he has created, and, and, and it isn't a flat line. Sometimes we look at creation as a flat line. Well, if I look real close, I can see the bumps, the hands. No, it, it goes from the center and it goes like this, whoosh. It's 360 degrees, all the way from, from where we are to the heavenlies, to the things we can't even see. And that's the God we serve. Those, that's the God whose promises were brought forward to Israel. That's the God who told Israel, Take forward my word, live amongst the people, and magnify and glorify me. And, and what ended up happening, they said, no, yeah, we're, yeah, we're just going to do things a little bit different. We're going to have a little bit different way to do things. Uh, and, and it's been by faith the entirety of the time that those have been created in the image of God have been created. The entirety is by faith. Through the grace of God, yet... 
yet corporate Israel sought something which they, they thought was better. Reading out of Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, a uh, new covenant with Israel is also spoken of. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, through, though I was husband to them, says the Lord, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. I'm going to just make a guess here. I'm going to say that the majority of us sitting here are the redeemed, if not all of us. No man knows another man's heart, right? But if you can remember back to that moment of your salvation, I want to read once again the last verse that I read. Um, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin, I will remember no more. Do you remember that moment? Do you remember that moment when who you were became who you was? And I know that's not good English, and Mrs. Pollard back there goes, there he is, there's Mr. Bill, and I know. Who, 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 who you was is not who you is at the present. God so grabbed you, and this is my own juvenile description of what happened. You ever see a dog just hanging out, going down the freeway with his face into the wind, his ears slapping, his jowls going back and forth, and, and he is the happiest thing in the world because he's getting full of air, he's getting all kinds of olfactory smells going on, and it's like life does not get any better for that dog. Well, I'm telling you, that's what my relationship feels like with the Lord, only exponentially greater. I'm that dog hanging out the window, jowls flapping, ears flapping, eyes watering, smelling all kinds of wonderful things and going, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Do you remember that moment? Because if you've forgotten that moment, then there could be a reason why you're complacent in your Christianity. There could be a reason why you don't see an opportunity in every person that comes along to ask how they're doing. And if they respond to you, then that's an open door. Things I like to do, and sometimes I think it drives my bride crazy, but I have other things to do that too, so hard to, hard to know. Is if you ask somebody how they're doing and they, they respond, it's like, I just have a question. Am I going to see you in eternity? And some people have that blank stare across their face. It's like, what are you talking about? No, I'm not going anyplace with you, especially eternity. But other people, they know right away. Praise God, you're a Christian too. And there's an opportunity to talk. There's an opportunity to witness. There's an opportunity to, to fellowship. And, and, and that is what Paul is talking about. And, and this letter to the Romans, it's an opportunity for all to fellowship. Reading out of John 10, verses 15 through 16, Jesus speaks of laying down his life for his sheep. Jesus speaking, he says, as the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. And they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock, and there will be one shepherd. One flock, and one shepherd. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that incredible? One flock, and one shepherd. They will hear his voice. 